Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 76th edition of Airhex TV with the uh, some breaking news actually. So let's see. The first thing is, um, watch this. This is a uh, micro profile workshop and uh, it's not done yet. So um, if I click this finish setup, it is going to be live, but I cannot do this because what is lacking is an intro video, a very short one. And I also have to rename all the titles here. But the good news are, um, it is one of the longest workshops, seven hours and 35 minutes. And what I'm going to do here is to implement a block engine from scratch. So what it means is um, I actually plan to uh, replace my own block with this engine, with the new one. And the idea came last year. Uh, as I start, I said, okay, I will, it would be nice to have uh, a very simple block engine uh, where I can customizable. And uh, I started to 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 think about this. And what happens in this workshop is I'm implementing um, the engine from scratch, but at the same time, uh, there is a real pro project where I just prototype several things, and both are going to be uh, open source. So uh, in the micro profile workshop. Uh, I'm uh, I'm going to to have a, a simplified edition, and in the uh, full uh, full repository, you will find a more sophisticated version, with, which is more suitable to use in production. For instance, there are better uh, title collision algorithms, stuff like that. And this is just focuses on micro profile. But what I'm doing here, I'm actually covering all the APIs. So the description is also not done. Um, yeah, micro profile training is going to be the repository but uh, it is not public yet. And uh, what I'm using here, I'm using Whitefly, Payara, Open Liberty, and um, in bonus episodes, I will, I will uh, migrate this to uh, Helidon and, uh, and Quarkus for fun. And uh, what I did is uh, I also used uh, GraalVM, but not the native compilation mode, rather than JavaScript to render the actual HTML. And um, there are two microservices communicated with each other, fault tolerance, patterns, and so forth included. So why I'm mentioning this now? Uh, because uh, it's funny. So the uh, the agenda of the uh, of the or the questions from the from this Airhex TV episode matches pretty exactly with uh, with the agenda of the um, of the workshop. So uh, what I used is a boundary control entity. I also explain why. What I also did, I tested a lot, uh, system tests, unit tests, and also explained why, and this is somehow related to the workshop. So, um, nice. And uh, yeah, to uh, further news, uh, Airhex Live is around the corner, um, and this is going to be a small show. Um, small shows means around 20 attendees, I think. And uh, why that? Because... Um, um, it, it was challenging how to set it up because of um, different, I mean, um, reasons which are um, w beyond uh, technology. It has something to do with the taxes, for instance. What um, and um, what uh, I announced is too too late. And then um, yeah, it was uh, the last uh, micro profile workshop or Quarkus. There were uh, around I think seventy attendees, and now we're at twenty, which is perfectly fine. So uh, what I wanted to say is, if you like. Uh, you can still register and there is something new so i got a uh, lots of questions uh, or requests from attendees they would like to attend a uh, workshop or who like pay with credit card or paypal pile and didn't, didn't want it to implement anything for credit card payment so there are two new possibilities first we have a meetup group where you can also register to paid workshop commercial workshops the uh, problem is, uh, or the problem is, um, what you can do is you can pay by PayPal, for instance. So you don't have, you know, uh, use uh, the invoicing, what I usually do. And the same is true for Eventbrite. So you can also buy tickets via Eventbrite, and then you can have even more payment options. So uh, I get pr um, requests from USA and and uh, India and, and Africa. They wanted, you know, to pay through different channels, not not via invoice. I, I don't know why. Probably because the wire transfer is a little bit more complicated. Now you can do this. Uh, having said that, I got the idea that actually uh, we could set up an, an Airhex meetup and just use it to announce, for instance, Airhex TV. What I also did, um, whenever there is a free show, which is with an online uh, link, I will publish it here. 
So that's uh, that's that's the idea. And um, so uh, there will be more and more events. And if I'm in, in, um, invited, for instance, to Java user group meetings, I will also post it here. So I will uh, use this meetup as a uh, how to call it announcement tool for free workshops as well. There will be probably you know 95% free stuff, and 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 uh, twice or, or th three to four times a year, a, uh, a a hex live workshop. Okay, so this was the uh, marketing stuff. And now start with the uh, content. And the first question is a very good one. What are my th thoughts on Jakarta MBC and its future? Um, and they say to me, it feels like it would have been appropriate to standardize over 10, year 10 years ago. But how is just adding overhead to Jakarta's industry has moved on from this kind of off? I guess, programming model. So, funny you write that because uh, in the uh, block engine, I used GraalVM and use uh, Mustache, a similar project to SPG, which is already open source, to render HTML. If Jakarta MVC would be available, I would use Jakarta MVC because in a, in a, in my uh, in in a block um, post, there is actually why I should 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 implement a server side uh, JavaScript. When it, and it can just deliver static HTML and everyone is happy. So no, no one complained that actually my my block is not uh, dynamic enough, right? So there's just content. Now, also interesting, there is an interesting service. Uh, you probably uh, heard about that. It's called Hey. It comes from the uh, Basecamp uh, base people. And uh, what they use behind the scenes is um, a stimulus framework so and the or framework library and uh, and the what stimulus does is it enriches on the server on the client static HTML with some dynamic behavior and they are really successful with it and this is actually um, this is called TurboLinks or PJAX and I think in uh, you will heard about, hear hear about this in view month or um, next year. And it could even take off the next, you know, hysteria. So, uh, is your application PJAX or TurboLinks ready? And um, so, what I wanted to say is, with Jakarta MVC, you could build similar applications. So, I don't think it's over. I think it could be really useful. And regardless how long it takes to standardize, if at the end of the day it is useful, it's fine. So I hope the question is answered. So from my perspective, go ahead. So why not? So I mean, we're absolutely, you know, buzzword compatible. Um, I don't think, uh, in, you know, uh, JavaScript frameworks have uh, a great bright future because the web standard is catching up. But uh, this is absolutely web standards compatible. So uh, you can, you can now provide more, do more and more on the server and less and less on the client. And um, Full page refresh is actually faster than you think. So uh, this is um, interesting, interesting story here. So you know, we're going full circle. Um, okay, again. Now, another thing is this. This is the uh, th this are the results of the Jakarta EE Developer Survey, and this is uh, one slide as I downloaded the uh, entire slide deck, but this is the the, the one uh, deck which is, um, or one slide which is uh, the, the overview slide. And uh, what surprised me, like the popularity of, of Spring and Spring Boot declines. I mean, um, that it declines a little bit. This is what was also my perception because uh, at the beginning, everyone was excited and hoped, you know, Spring will be, you know, the leanest possible framework. And then the other day is just another framework. And, um, and uh, but it declined 13 percent. This is a lot, and from my perspective, a little bit too much. So what I see, but um, what I also see in projects that there is some you know movement from Spring to somewhere else. Now, what I was surprised actually by the popularity of Jakarta EE by 35 percent. So my perception is a micro profile should be actually more popular than Jakarta EE. Also, uh, from my perspective, it is really hard to differentiate between Jakarta EE and Eclipse micro profile. For instance. In the uh, micro profile workshop, I used uh, JSONP, JSONB, CDI, JAXRS, and uh, bin validation, for instance, from Jakarta. But all the you uh, know the 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 the, the base, um, the, the most important APIs, they are actually coming from Jakarta. E. 
So um, how to differentiate that? Because if you would remove from micro profile, CDI, JaxOS, and JSONP and JSONB, you couldn't implement anything. So you cannot just have, you know, matrix without dependency injection. So this is a little bit strange. I, I would just, you know, see both as a one thing. And also what surprised me, that Quarkus is um, not more popular than 16%. So um, why this? If we take a look, this is, was a German survey, which I uh, remembered, and it was in February 2020. And um, so it was uh, 20, so it was end of year. And what they found out is the following, that, where is it? This is in German. That 22% the, uh, the um, participants found... Um, Quarkus very interesting, and uh, and uh, very interesting, and twenty five percent interesting, and back then they said uh, Quarkus is the fastest growing framework ever, and now um, half a later, it is just sixteen percent, and what I can also tell you is that um, uh, Quarkus is actually all over the place, and from from my perspective, is the fastest growing framework ever in Java in, in Java ecosystem. So this was also my take on that. Now, which also surprised me, Vertex is 13, 14%. This is what I don't see at all. I, I would say Quarkus is orders of magnitude more popular than Vertex, but Quarkus uses Vertex behind the scenes. So, I mean, what, what's that? What's also surprised me, the Drop Wizard is as popular 10% so Micronode. So from time to time, I hear you know, uh, uh, about uh, my opinions about uh, Micronode, but uh, a Drop Wizard is like, uh, I think the last two years, I never heard uh, about Drop Wizard. So, but still, good news. So Jakarta gains popularity, Microprofile as well, and Quarkus is, yeah, looks just great. So, okay. This was uh, the latest news. And now the next question from Ronald. He uh, wrote me a mail what's, um, that, um, and he would like to, to, to get my opinion about the job runner framework he wrote. And uh, I was curious, I took a look at the source code and I said, okay, a little bit strange or unusual for me. I, what I assumed is that the Ronald found me on Airhex TV and he knows me a little bit. And he just uh, read uh, the, um, the, uh, my blog posts. But I took a look at the job runner framework and this is that. And it, uh, for first, I, I thought, okay, this is a library like Porcupine, what I implemented. But this is more than that, and it's actually used in production. And what happens behind the scenes is the following. Is um, the, uh, you can, it, it works best with lambdas, so you can implement lambdas here. And the lambdas get serialized and sent over the network from all the uh, uh, queues into one central location and then gets processed uh, by, by, by background processor. It's like um, what I did um, a, a few years ago, we already covered this on the AHEX TV. For instance, I, was, uh, I put some uh, JavaScript code to, to Hazelcast and Hazelcast moved around. Uh, Hazelcast, its JavaScript code was a string and moved around. And I was able to execute the logic on every node, for instance. So this is something similar, but uh, even more useful because you can just use, you know, one liner, a, a, a lambda, and uh, it gets with um, uh, bytecode processing gets serialized, and then the other side deserialized, and uh, it looks really interesting. And um, and uh, I was actually curious who, who Ronald is, and invited him to my podcast. The episode is already recorded, and I will publish it next week. So I think even tomorrow or day after. And um, it turns out that the Ronald has a, a huge experience in uh, .NET um, ecosystem as well. And we had a nice chat about an interesting .NET framework called Mediator and how to map it to Java. But if you like, take a look at the job runner. It's this interesting library. And uh, just give feedback at the next AHX TV. So it would be nice. Okay, and Ronald had also had a question, but he uh, found the answer by himself. So um, his question was, how to create a bin without XML in micro profile? I think, Ronald, it was just hard to create a bin with XML in micro profile. So it's like, it's, everything is without XML, but thank you. 
Oh, and this is Alexei uh, asked a question is uh, exactly what I did in the uh, micro profile workshop. He asked, could you make some summaries about testing BCE based applications? I remember you mentioned about testing classes in the boundary, but what about control? As I saw even separate projects for test. Yeah. Um, so simple. So what, how BC is tested? E is our entities. How they are tested with um, in, uh, integration tests or it's fail safe usually. Everything which ends with IT is the entity test. What I usually do, I boot the um, entity manager without the server. This uh, persistence create entity manager factory. And by the way, there is an old uh, old workshop uh, yeah, hex, but it still explains everything. And this is, the workshop is um, testing. Effective Java E testing. This is the workshop. And actually, whatever I did here, it's, uh, this is, I exactly do this still. And um, so you can just boot the entity manager and test entities as POJO, so you don't need any dependency injection. What about control? So control, also in my course, which is going to be published in the next two, three days, the MicroProfile Apps course or workshop. I just use unit tests, plain unit tests about controls. And in one, um, in one um, uh, episode or in one part, what I remember what I did, I mock out with Mokito MicroProfile metrics. Uh, and this is the fastest possible way. And separate projects is only in microservice um, environment where you, you would like to have something like system tests. That's all. So um, Alexey asked me also what one more question about testing. If you have two tests, some private method in some service class. Okay, usually I don't have private methods in service class which are relevant. So is it okay to make it package visible? Yes. Or move it to some control class and write test to this control. So um, I have package private visibility. A uh, private is is not existing in business apps. So if you build framework and you would like to hide something, go with private. But in business apps, I don't use private a lot, and, and it works. Or everyone is happy. Now, uh, Robert asked me, what's the best way to share constants between Java backend and JavaScript frontend? And um, I have a view Java enums in my backend, which I would like that my JS frontend would use to avoid duplication or mismatches. So um, the question is, you know, how many such constants do you have? So um, if you have a few Java enums, I don't care. If you have a lot, you can do something about that. For instance, you can expose uh, Java enums. You can have a JSONB object just with the enums and just send them over the wire. And on the other, uh, other uh, side, you can fetch the object and you have your constants, right? So uh, you can do this. Uh, so it it's just works. I mean, uh, you can uh, absolutely do this. So you, you can have one constant service in the backend and all relevant constants you can put to a JSONB object called my constant. My, don't call it my constants. Call it some, somehow reasonable. Uh, add all constants you like and send them to, uh, to, the, to the server, uh, to the client. That's all. So, M1K0 registered, ask me. Very, impro very important productivity is testing. Yeah, in Jakarta is super worth testing. Spring Boot, can we can create tests, integration testing? I, I think something different. Integration testing means you would test one class without mocking out the environment. It would be like uh, entity manager test by simply adding Spring Boot and everything important for tests are launching. So in our case, we don't have to add anything. We just launch the Entity Manager and it should work with Spring Boot as well. Uh, and then simple enter Maven clean very verify and we can focus only on business logic. Um, exactly. So uh, this is what we focus on business logic and, um, and uh, let's see whether I find The code, so block pad. It is not public yet, but it should be soon. So let's see what I. Um, oh, by the way, this is a post store test already, and what I have here is title normalizer test, which is a control, and uh, this is a the control is a pojo. This is just nothing, and the test. Is title normalizer test is just a unit test. So this is the entire test. And let's see whether it works. 
depends which Java version I have right now. How to tell, right? Oh, it tries to debug this. Uh, CD, uh, this was, what was it? Uh, title normalizer, I think this is the content microservice. Co uh, content, content, and then if I will switch to content and say maven test, clean test, then it should perform all the unit tests. Now it's done. Um, yeah. And the system tests, uh, this is a different folder. It is in content SD. And here, for instance, what uh, there's still no magic here. And uh, but what I have here is, uh, yeah, with some barrier tokens for JSON web token. But I use post resource client usually, and this can be used in the system tests by this is here, REST client builder. Yeah, this is how I create the reference to the remote location. And this uses micro profile config. And this is no magic. So I could use uh, Quarkus, for instance. It uh, understands independence injection during tests, but this is no magic. And of course, what I have to do, I have to write, you know, the three lines of code, but uh, it, it works it's very fast. Okay, this is, um, the code is going to be published soon, so I can take a look at this. Um, why I wrote the test, it is not part of the course because in MicroProfile there is nothing specific about testing, but I was faster with it, so this is why I did it. And um, if you take a look on my production block engine, there will be some more tests, but this is how I test, and this I don't think any framework will help me to, to, to be faster. So, and now, let's see if I... Um, let's see if I do create and create a uh, Quarkus application uh, group ID uh, AI hacks uh, testing yes go ahead testing and take a look look at the at the source code so then if I would launch the test and this is in hello resource IT uh, sorry Hello resource test. This is the Quarkus test application. And then you can use dependence injection here. So uh, I don't use the uh, the REST assured at all. I still use MicroProfile REST client. But this is a little bit nicer because what happens then is the MicroProfile REST client respects MicroProfile config. So um, you have three lines of code less. It's a little bit slower, but uh, you, you can, this is actually. It behaves like Quarkus in production, but this is in test mode. And having said that, in one of my microservice projects, Quarkus microservice projects, we have actually have two modules. One uh, real module and the system test only comprises the Quark, um, classes with Quarkus test. Now the question is, why I use separate uh, packages or modules? And the answer is because for me, it is impossible to have system tests or black box tests in the microservice itself, with Java at least. Why? Because Java would see the entire class path. And what I'm testing is actually, I, I have m more classes which I can use for tests than I actually would have in a micro profile or micro profile microservice environment. So for me, it doesn't make any sense. And if I have two modules, which I have here, so where is here? I have here content and uh, content ST, hopefully. Yeah. Content and content ST, what I also have, I have two different versions. I have version one, which is in my case doesn't matter because it's about microservices workshop rather than micro profile APIs, should be the same. But over time, if this will be a serious project, I will just increase both versions. And what I would could do is very easily test backward compatibility. So I could check, you know, check out all the versions from micro profile and, and compare them against the newer, newer version. So okay. And Archelian, I use Archelian only for specific cases. I used in the MicroProfile workshop JUnit 5, but I try to avoid it actually. Why? Because I don't like the additional plugin configuration. Um, yeah. And how to re test REST endpoints? You saw that. JPA with database in memory. It was memory. I uh, use Derby DB or H2. Both are um, memory. In microservice project, what I tend to do is I test uh, with for instance, um, uh, database running in the cloud or on OpenShift. CDI, 
a CDI is very easy because you can uh, start CDI in Java SE mode, so you don't need anything. And JMS is the hardest because of asynchronous behavior, not because uh, not because um, there is something special. But how to how you would like to test in you know, Notify and forget really hard. So um, Vanuatu asked me in Java E we typically use JaxRS with stateless EGBs in Quarkus. What in Quarkus? What would be the correct scope? Stateless, request scoped, or application scoped. I would say request scoped because it behaves uh, very similar to stateless EGBs and in Quarkus there is no performance penalty because there's no reflection so it should be still as fast as it was before and uh, the true what I will do is to create a stereotype with request scoped and transactional then it is almost identical I would say to EGB without of course um, max pool size settings and, and but you could use bulkheads instead for instance right so uh, Dempile uh, and and Dempile comes over and over back. He he does a uh, lots of work with Payara Micro and Hazelcast. Seems like it's really interesting what Dempile is actually building. But uh, what 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 uh, he got is problems with application scope serialization and asked me you know uh, what what to do about that. So um, how to avoid application scope? So usually you don't need application scope. So in the uh, micro profile workshop, um, so why I'm talking so, so a lot about micro profile workshop because it belongs to me and there are no NDAs. So I cannot just talk about uh, real world projects. This is why I'm usually excited about something small I build because I can show you the code, right? So now um, application scope. So I, I use the uh, EJB singletons and then application uh, application scoped uh, observes initialized event to start up uh, a class. This is usually the case wh where you, wh when you need application scoped or uh, singleton EJBs. But what you can do is um, you can have a control class with behavior which is not scoped at all or whatever scope works for you and then just use um, application scoped or singleton as a decorator to boot your class. This is one thing. And if you have Hazelcast, you don't need usually uh, singletons because Hazelcast is already your singleton. So I don't think you need it for as, as a cache because Hazelcast is already the cache. Cool. Um, next one is, um, is it possible or is it possible? Yeah, is it possible to build a multi-tenant Jakarta e micro profile app so that each tenant has its own database database schema? Yes, it is very possible, and we already did it. And I think I already already answered the question the last week, uh, month, seventy fifth uh, Air Hex TV, I guess. So, um, how to switch dynamically at runtime between different databases schemas for each HTTP request via web filter thread local? Uh, yeah, what you will need is you will need a let's say micro profile. Then every tenant has a JSON web token. What you can do, you can inject a claim. In the claim is the tenant ID. So because a claim is something configurable, so you have the claim. If you don't have JSON web token, then you can use principles. Principles are unique. So um, for instance, principle name. So with that, you can absolutely. Um, use uh, CDI producers, which produces different entity managers dependent on depending on the ID or the JSON web token. Having said that, I would try to, I don't like the multi-tenancy a lot because it complicated complicates things, but from, from, from the, um, it is doable. And we did it already, but um, what I usually would like to do is instead of you know, uh, dynamically inject something. I would rather you know, inject every entity manager I know from all clients to one class and then have very simple switch and return this what actually matters, which is more stable. Is it possible to switch dynamically at runtime the entity manager and transaction manager per request? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is what I said. And can you show us a POC? I, I, I mean, I could. This is just produces entity manager and instead of persistence context you could use at inject and um, and then you get the entity manager back and um, let's see what you can also do is something like this uh, let's see can I actually create here I overlook the POC section. So go here. This is long, long ago. Let's see uh, whether it will work. Java, hello resource. So now imagine, 
So there is no entity manager, but we could have a class called, you know, not entity manager like entity controller, let's say. So now what what I could do is I could say at inject instance, this is CDI in instance of uh, entity controller controller and this uh, inject I think any so it will inject with whatever qualifiers they have and then uh, what I can do is just uh, um, so let's here I would like to fetch something from the database right string um, find what find order by tenant and then uh, this controller dot uh, select and now uh, then you, you can do some research but I also did it so several times this should be on my YouTube channel as well as on the uh, the, uh, the workshops about uh, Jakarta e. what you can do you can create an instance of a qualifier and then select on the fly the entity managers you have so this is absolute um, and then say if you have the selection then you can invoke get what you can also do you can check whether they are multiple or none so this is at runtime and with proprietary uh, hibernate and uh, eclipse link features you can even instantiate everything on uh, at, at the runtime and in the case of eclipse link you can even uh, create entities or, or deploy entities at runtime so uh, yeah it's very possible not advisable but possible so this is I hope this is good enough. Okay, uh, we don't need it anymore. So this is just... So, how can I reuse JPA enti uh, entities across multiple projects? So if th this is not a micro-profile project, you can absolutely do this. What is to do? You need an, uh, an uh, jar with uh, persistence XML inside a jar, and you can reference the jar and... Uh, or... No, wait a second. Um, you probably don't need, you don't like the persistence entity, um, sorry, the uh, persistence XML in this jar. So you have a jar with just entities, and then you can have uh, in the projects uh, wars with persistence XML, which points to the jar. I think this is um, jar file is the tag. So the wars can point to a central location where the jar file lives. Um, yeah, and the Maven uh, module would be a jar module. Uh, what dependencies? Um, just you, they have point to this to this module, and configurations none actually. In the jar there should be no configuration, and in the other modules there is the specific configuration. So uh, this is a good one uh, because uh, it's also you know uh, what is the basic difference between a Jakarta e and MicroProfile server, Micronaut or Payara Micro. Uh, and by the way, MicroProfile, Micronaut is none of them. There is neither Jakarta nor MicroProfile, and therefore I never use Micronaut because I, why I should you know, learn new API. And uh, Helidon and, for instance, Quarkus and all the other servers, or, or Piranha, interesting one on the horizon, they come with MicroProfile and Jakarta compatibility, which is actually great. So because I don't have to relearn the thing. And by the way, the Jakarta and MicroProfile are very, very similar. So I can actually migrate applications back and forth. And um, yes, the micro is small and the full is big. Not true, actually. Uh, listen to the uh, Airhex FM podcast, Airhex FM, with, uh, oh, by the way, uh, interesting discussion on the Airhex FM with uh, Kevin Sutter about Jakarta EM and MicroProfile and uh, also with Eric Koslo about um, about uh, Java security as well. This is uh, the newer episodes. And uh, with Lenny Primack, this is one friend of the show. And I think the last one, this was, is the Visual Studio Code um, episode. So Fred uh, Bryken, he's behind Visual Studio Code and what they actually do um, to keep it fresh. So, okay. Um, ah, I forgot the actual thing. There is an episode with Steve Millich, Payara Micro versus Payara Server Full, which will discuss exactly that. What's the difference between them? And it turns out that Payara Micro for now is just a fork of the Payara Server Full, and the Payara, Payara Server Full uses OSGI, and the Payara Micro does not use that. 
So that's that's the difference. Uh, if you ask me, I will always use the Payara server full because there is more more documentation, more experience, and Payara Micro is more a specific, I would say, a specific solution. So even in the uh, in my uh, micro profile workshop, I also used the Payara server full because there was no reason. You will see this is as fast or yeah, it's no reason to use the the, the micro profile. How it's called? Micro, micro. Um, yes, uh, so what is missing in the micro is the domain uh, admin console you know, and OSGI, so it's less dynamic, but I would go with full. Why that? Because if you have you know, questions, you will find old Glassfish documentation and it still is compatible with Payara. Okay, uh, Simonk92. I think 92 could be his birth date, I guess. So uh, one of the older uh, Java programmers. <laughs> In my project, we use pretty complicated access policy, which, which for every entity has a user and group rights. User group rights. Okay, you can imagine that. Groups might be predefined as well as created by the administrator user. Yes. For, so for every entity user, for group or both, we can have read, write, owner, and rights. By the way, uh, this um, the uh, rights discussion and the multi-tenant discussion. So what uh, most of the JPA frameworks are able to do, they are able to enhance the queries on the fly and fetch just your relevant tenant data and so forth. And the reason being is at the Jakarta E7 timeframe, it was pl planned to be a cloud solution and multi-tenant solution. And then they rolled that back, but Eclipsing and Hibernate can st still do this. So take a look on that. Um, this approach requires two additional tables, yeah, and has multiple joints, uh, joints also true. Uh, do you know any better way to manage rights for entities? I was wondering if you could use Keycloak to help us with that. So you could use uh, Keycloak, and you can use uh, the Keycloak user and groups and policies. What Keycloak will give you is whether in which uh, roles or rights the user has or not. So... Uh, so this is just like the 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 data source, but not you know there there is no integration between Keycloak and JPA. So um, what we did prior to all this is um, and actually there let and I'm being uh, Java EE let's say authorization CDI. I did it a lot back then. Yeah, that's all. Seven years ago, you will have to watch this video. Oh. Uh, very old video, and what I'm doing here is I'm 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 getting my principal, and then depending on the uh, on the on the name, I fetch my own principal with rights, and they can be you know hierarchical rights, list rights, or whatever, and uh, I think it will still work. Uh, so it, it the question is just how you select the relevant data from the database. I think this is your complexity. And maybe what's what can happen is that um, that uh, a non-relational database could provide you best, better, I would say, better performance and easier code than a relational database. This this could happen, but um, yeah, this is what I can tell you. Um, and by the way, I got this T-shirt from Java User Group in Romania, and because there's a Dracula on the on the T-shirt, so that's what I remember. Interesting. Seven years ago, crazy. That's really crazy. I thought this was like you know, two, three year, years ago, and yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think we are done. Let's uh, take a look whether... Um, but we are over time anyway. So um, if you have any questions left, just, uh, you know, uh, I will create a gist in, in a few days. See you at Airhex Live, and uh, what I also will do, I will announce all the Airhex TV on the Airhex Meetup group. So if you like, join the group, and um, and at the next Airhex, uh, I will probably you know announce the micro profile workshop again. And yeah, thank you. See you at Airhex Live, Airhex Live, and uh, check out the um, the uh, Meetup group with the name Ehex. So thank you for watching and bye.